Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Cheryl, and I work as a UX consultant in ThoughtWorks. Um, I started designing website when I was 17 years old, and uh, that experience has shaped me as a person who could design a web product for users uh, who would love to use it. Uh, that's a bit about myself. Um, my name is uh, my name is Krishna, but uh, generally go by the name KK. So it's uh, one KK replacing the other <laughs> on the stage right now. Um, so uh, my journey into uh, ID started uh, 11 years ago. Uh, nine years ago, I joined a startup, and we were very agile, uh, even though we didn't know what agile really was back then. And uh, that's when my journey into agile started. Uh, for the past six years, I've been working with ThoughtWorks. Uh, in multiple roles, uh, primarily uh, I joined as a QA, uh, but I also worked as a consultant, coach, business analyst, and on the latest, latest project I'm working as a project manager with Cheryl, and uh, uh, I have uh, a deep connection with UX because I like to use uh, uh, products that, that have really good user experience. So that's uh, about me, and outside of work, I like to bike, and that's my picture of me biking. Cool. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we are sharing our experience on uh, how we achieved um, building incremental UX uh, user experience in an, one of the agile projects that we are working on. So traditionally, if you see, uh, UX uh, wasn't given that much importance or value. So the, the user experience uh, designers would always be siloed. Uh, that has changed uh, radically in the last few years. However. Um, if you think about the agile practices itself, right, they do address uh, most of the uh, core development uh, issues or testing issues or analysis issues. But even now, if you see, they seldom address the user experience. So how do you really think about building user experience in an incremental fashion uh, in an agile project? And we have faced some problems uh, in the earlier projects uh, which we failed to address. But then when we just started this project, we thought, okay, there are some lessons learned for us, and we should uh, make the most out of it. Uh, there's some challenges that we faced, and we wanted to basically um, tackle those up front. So that was the, the prime motive, and that was the prime goal when we actually started this, uh, started working on this project. So uh, with that, right, uh, let me set a little bit of context before I uh, uh, discuss, like, what are the techniques that we used uh, to solve uh, or to basically uh, mitigate some of the risks with not doing uh, user experience designing incrementally. Um, so about the context, right? Uh, so this was a client who was new to a child, um, and he wanted to launch a product, and the product was going to be a digital wallet. And he wanted to explore a market which uh, neither he nor us, uh, us had a lot of experience with. Um, and this product was going to be used, uh, you know, uh, across multiple age groups, right, from students to housewives to regular employees to senior citizens. So. Again, uh, usability and the user experience mattered a lot to us, uh, and it had to be built right from day one. Um, this wallet was going to be uh, supported on multiple devices, multiple screen sizes. So, again, like from an implementation point of view, we had to take care of that. Uh, plus, uh, the market that we're talking about in terms of uh, the geographical area already had uh, a similar competing product. So staying ahead of the game was another important challenge. Uh, so we wanted to release as soon as we can, as well as uh, do further incremental releases uh, as frequently as possible. So Agile as a solution worked really for that problem statement. But again, like coming back to how do you really get your incremental uh, user experience in sync with that? So with that context, right, one of the things, um, so coming to the solution part, right, one of the things that helped us, the first step is to plan uh, for uh, UX in an incremental fashion, right? And one thing that we needed to do here in this phase was to educate the clients. Basically, uh, what I mean by that you know, is you have learned your experiences on um, how it is difficult uh, to imagine full and complete designs when you really don't have them. Uh, for example, in an agile project, you take uh, and build chunk by chunk. Basically, you pick a story, it's not full story, it's just half, half the story. So how do you really um, set the expectations of the client on saying, hey, this, this is story, but the user experience for this is not going to be full or fuller, it's just going to be half baked. So setting that expectation uh, becomes really important, right? And, and especially with clients who are 
new to agile and who have uh, completely different um, experience on uh, building products right one thing uh, so so this is a, at a higher level but what did we actually do to educate right so so we created something called as a design vision document um Cheryl will give you more insights on what this contains and how uh, we get this Yep. So uh, traditionally, if you look at any software development and uh, we want to uh, create a product, uh, the first thing that happens before the actual development of the product is that uh, designers create a bunch of uh, Photoshop files which will have uh, the pages and different modules and the look and feel of the entire uh, product itself. So it's going to take a longer time for the designers to brainstorm with the clients and come up with these designs and ideas and put across to the development team itself. So what is going to happen is that uh, the developers are on, a, on, a, on one fine day, they get a bunch of PSDs and a bunch of amazing screens and uh, uh, cool stuff to do it. Uh, but in Agile, uh, we believe that we want to break the uh, larger chunks of work into smaller work so that we could get feedback quickly and also we could uh, course correct the entire uh, problems that we face during the design process itself. So uh, what we decided was we will create, we, we decided to create a design vision document. Uh, this document basically has a higher level understanding of the design itself, which means uh, when we design this project, when we finish this project, the design is going to shape up um, in, a, in, a, in a particular way, rather than um, getting into the elements of the designs, getting into each and every components of the design and understanding in deeper level, which is going to take a longer time. Um, rather than spending more time on that, we wanted to uh, break the design process itself and incrementally design the project. Um, so this design vision document uh, contains elements such as typeface palette, uh, color palette, and some of the sample designs that uh, how our product is going to look like. So again, what is so different about the traditional brand guidelines and our our uh, vision document is that we didn't want to get deeper into the design and spend lots and lots of time on analysis of the elements itself. What we wanted to show is that, hey, uh, when we finish our product, our product is going to look something like this. So for example, this is a screenshot from our document, which says that, which shows that our product, our marketing side of our product is going to turn up something like this. But when we created this, we did not get into a uh, deep level of analysis of individual components. What we decided was, over a period of time, this design is going to evolve. This, uh, this, this elements in the design is going to shape up really well, and we wanted to do it incrementally. And one more uh, screenshot which we shared with the client was, uh, um, hey, when our product has been uh, developed completely, uh, our product is going to shape up something like this. It's going to look responsive in an iPhone uh, this particular way. Um, so, and also we also wanted to establish some of the basic principles that our design uh, of the product is going to be. For example, we created uh, tabular uh, components, we created uh, uh, design for um, uh, uh, forms and buttons and the common uh, elements which is uh, across all the products, we wanted to uh, establish some of the fundamental guidelines for the design itself. So. Uh, so we were able to finish uh, this particular document in about uh, uh, one iteration where we were able to present this to the clients and we were able to build the trust that, hey, uh, our product is going to shape up this particular way in this direction in terms of design and we want to create an amazingly uh, better user experience for the user itself. And uh, one of the things uh, that we wanted to do was how well we can um, implement or design this incremental UX uh, throughout our product development. So um, some of the benefits that we will get out of this incremental UX is that uh, we will get uh, quicker feedback from the users and also the clients, and we will also be able to have a, a, a faster UI development, and also we will be we will not be uh, compromising on the UX itself. So one of the things that how we, could, how we were able to get the uh, faster feedback from the client was with the help of paper prototyping. So uh, if you look at paper prototyping, paper pr prototyping is a technique where uh, we will sketch out our ideas on a paper, we will share it with the client, and also we will do some amount of user testing and get uh, feedback from the users and the clients very quickly. 
So if you look at the traditional uh, way of uh, design, uh, what, is, uh, what typically happens is that uh, they create some uh, uh, PSDs, which is so beautiful. They spend lots and lots of time on creating the PSD itself. Now the client says that, hey, um, this design will not work in the market. It's going to take a lot and lo lot of time to correct the design itself. So we implemented this technique for each and every stories in our project. So let me uh, run through one of the stories that which we uh, worked on. So um, this is a story where uh, we had a dashboard and uh, we wanted to display some amount of statistical data on the dashboard itself. So we quickly uh, mocked up a paper prototype for this story and we did a few iterations for this uh, paper prototype and we got some feedback from the clients. And once we felt that, um, hey, uh, this is a kind of requirements we could take and we could think about the visual aspect of it and we can convert that into the actual code itself, we went about and uh, looking at, we went about and thought deeper into the visual uh, aspects of this uh, prototype itself. So for example, if you look at this story, uh, some of the elements which is present in this story was not there in the vision document itself. So we thought, hey, we need to implement uh, the visual aspect of these components which is present in this paper prototype. So hence, we picked up those components which was not there in the vision document, and we created those components and we shared that with the client again. And uh, we were able to get the feedback from the client before the actual development itself. And once this is done, um, um, the, the, the story is actually uh, ready for the developers to pick up and uh, work on. So um, when I say the story is uh, ready for the developers to pick on, uh, even during that stage, uh, the, the UX or the UI developers will be highly uh, collaborative with the developers uh, to work on these uh, uh, visual aspects of the product itself. For example, what I meant was um, we... Did you, did you take this We did a couple of things. One is that we uh, shared this with the stakeholders, uh, that is the clients, as well as uh, the project team itself, uh, and got their feedback. So um, uh, what I meant about the project team is that uh, some of, uh, sometimes the designer will have amazing ideas, but then when it has to be implemented uh, in the actual code, uh, maybe there will be a performance issue, or maybe there is something that is blocking to bring that exact experience what the designer is thinking about. That is something which we got with the paper prototype itself. And to answer your question, some part of it, yes, we did with the actual users itself, and some part of it, we, uh, we did not do user testing. We, we uh, only did with the clients and got the feedback. Yeah. So, so one thing there that helped us was, uh, so, so only uh, very few times we could find uh, people outside the company to get feedback, but in general, uh, if you find people outside of your project who don't have a lot of context on the project, they will give almost like real feedback on how they would use the system and that helped us again. So it, it was not just your peers in the project, but also people who are not, not on that, not working on that product, uh, but outside. So that uh, kind of helped us uh, design this better and get, get better feedback. Right. So um, traditionally, if you look at uh, some of the things uh, that a UI developer or a developer will have is that, hey, uh, we want the design for the entire page to start the development because uh, we need to architecture the CSS framework or the JavaScript framework. And uh, 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 this is basically a, a mind, mind shift or a thought process which the UI developers have in their mind saying that, hey, we cannot uh, start with the uh, CSS framework until and unless we see the entire design um, altogether. So uh, that's something we thought radically and we decided that we will design the UI components on a story level basis and not as a whole saying that, hey, let's finish the UI development and then the develop actual development starts after that. We did not do that. So something we did was a living style guide. So what Living Style Guide is, uh, basically, um, the Style Guide will have a, a, a live documentation of your CSS components itself. So for example, let's say, um, uh, uh, let's say there is a story uh, to uh, create a login for the user, and uh, the user should be able to uh, uh, see their front screen. So what we need to do in terms of the CSS is that we need a form to log in. 
and uh, we need to see the um, uh, logged in information on the front page. So we were trying to abstract these components. So, if, if, uh, so to say abstraction means one of the things is that there is a form element to it, right? So um, we started writing the code for the form itself. We put that form uh, in something called a living style guide. So whenever we will have to uh, work around with the similar components, the developers or the UI developers or um, any other uh, uh, player in the team will go to the living style guide and see, hey, this is the form we, which we already have in our application. Let's see how to reuse this form. Or in other words, is there any other way that we could improvise this form itself? So we were able to abstract uh, the components on a story level and uh, were able to build the UX in an incremental fashion rather than traditionally how they do saying that, hey, let's finish the UI development let's, and then let's start the development. So uh, I'll showcase some of the uh, screenshots from the Living Style Guide itself. So uh, this is the component which uh, you would have seen, you would have noticed in the paper prototype. So when we did that um, story, we identified that this is a component which, might, which we might be using um, more often in our product or um, in that particular story itself, right? So we abstracted this component and we created the CSS and HTML markup for this component. And there was uh, some bit of JavaScript on this component and we also added the JavaScript for this component. And if you look at this component, again, there is abstraction in this component itself. So for example, if you look at this bar there, it's, it's a component by itself. So whenever there is a bar in your product, you could go ahead and you, know, you could use this, reuse this code. So um, this, this was one of our approach uh, which really helped us to um, uh, you know, uh, do uh, UI development in a faster way. And over a period of time, developers started uh, uh, picking up UI stories. That way, um, all the UI-related work is not attached with or dependent on one particular person or uh, the UI development team itself. And also one more, uh, one more thing that which we cautiously did was UI developers and developers don't work in silos. Whenever we, whenever we uh, designed uh, or developed this component, they pair together to see, hey, what is the semantic way of writing the, this component? What is the best way to put across the JavaScript, which is you know, quite flex flexible and robust, robust to, uh, uh, with our product? And um, these are some of the examples of our components. So just, uh, just before we end, right, uh, uh, collaboration of the design. So the living style guide uh, that uh, Cheryl was talking about, uh, it was basically an abstraction uh, or a running document. Uh, and whenever you design new components, whenever newer components, we made sure that we maintain this documentation uh, or we maintain this uh, live style guide for others to pick up. So during the course of our project, we had uh, other remote, team, uh, uh, remote teams that started working with us. And it was just amazing to see how they could wrap up so quickly just uh, by looking at that uh, style guide and wrap up at, at least on the UI aspects of it and uh, maintain such a consistent design and uh, consistent UI uh, across the site. So that was uh, one uh, good benefit that we got out of the living style guide. Uh, the other thing uh, about collaboration um, uh, to remember is uh, what Cheryl said about uh, uh, having the developers and uh, the QAs and the BAs uh, also keep in the loop uh, about the design decisions. So whenever we had to deal with um, or uh, come up with new designs or make any design decisions, it helps to keep um, developers and BAs uh, in loop. And so th this serves two purposes. One is uh, like it validates the feasibility uh, of the technical implementation from a UI perspective, as well as it doesn't compromise on uh, uh, or keeps a balance between the usability and the utility of the product. So those are a uh, uh, couple of things that we solved uh, by collaboration. Um, so to conclude, right, uh, something that we did differently, uh, different from the other projects that we had experiences on building uh, incremental user experience was want to set the right, expect, uh, the right expectations with the client so that uh, uh, the clients have better idea on how the UI is going to shape up over the period of time. The second is to, uh, in the implementation phase itself, use a couple of techniques um, like paper prototyping and uh, abstraction um, to make sure that uh, we get faster feedback and our delivery is faster itself. Um, and this helps us do continuous delivery on this product. The other thing is uh, uh, 
make sure that uh, like we collaborate in the other uh, other sections of agile, but make sure that we uh, like even when we are doing design, uh, we take care of this and we include all the stakeholders. Um, and that's about it. Thanks. Questions. person yeah or maybe you're reaching out to the client mm -hmm. what are the challenges which you which you face and how you try to overcome because it's not closer to the end users feedback sure agreed uh, agreed um, so one thing one challenge is availability simply availability because um, you you don't you don't find people from that region that easily uh, however luckily for us since uh, we are a global company we had our own office in the geographical region that we're talking about so there is a thought of that office and we contacted people from that office to make sure that they test our application and we um, and also uh, not just the user experience design and also in terms of implementation and uh, also in terms of you know deployments right so it it, it gets better like if you uh, get people from that region so in terms of uh, user experience at least like we we were lucky enough to get people from there um, so that that's how I addressed we addressed one challenge um, yeah, but but uh, I understand your point that it can get difficult in terms of getting people from different age groups. Um, but that basically uh, can be solved by when you release your beta version uh, and you get uh, feedback from the real users. So your point is necessarily it not it need not be through the client. You have to reach, you can reach through your own. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the point. You yeah. Find your own ways out to reach out to the different strata of customers. Yeah, yeah. Prospective. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is, um, most often not. Most often, it, it wouldn't be the clients who would actually, you know, facilitate the user testing. Um, if uh, you're responsible for creating uh, a good user experience, uh, it's your responsibility to go find that user base, or mm -hmm. at least uh, uh, design something that you think is appropriate for that particular user base. So part of your responsibility is to also to make sure that you kind of get some feedback from that user base and design a product accordingly. So you cannot design something today and say, hey, uh, uh, is this going to work? Just to the clients, because they might, again, uh, uh, be not in a position to you know, do proper user testing. So we assume that responsibility partly. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks guys. Hey, he has a question. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, then uh, you mentioned about the living style guide. You have uh, for the bar app, you have a typical code. Which, which will simulate and you can reuse across different yeah. places where you can do the part. But I'm looking at a uh, you know, Agile perspective. When you are developing a story, which has a function part and the UI part. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned that the CSS part, if you have to think of and develop, it takes a long, it takes a long time and you have to deliver that. And then the development team start working, fine. But even doing this bar graph, I have to have a CSS in, in the field in the page, I have to have a whole page and there the bar graph comes in. Sure. So these are like reusable part of uh, components like bar graph or status bar, or whichever you have, it's a library and the team need, needs to use that, yeah. isn't it? Or it's like you, you design a new UI in a paper uh, prototype or whatsoever and give it to the customers and they have to use. Uh, you can't just give smaller uh, components and ask the development team to work on it. I, I didn't get how it works as a, uh, in, in a story level, you do this small chunk and yes, it gets realized and visualized. Okay, so your question is like, um, there is a there is a page which has a lot of components, but how do you uh, actually pick up one, abstract one components and do on a story level? So, uh, like I said, that's where the uh, vision document helped us a lot, right? So. Let's say, let's take an example, say a dashboard. A dashboard has different components in itself, right? But when you are working on a story, you work on only one particular component, right? So the, the project team as well as the clients is aware that once the dashboard is completely designed, it's going to look something like that. But for now, we are only focusing on the bars that has to be done. Yes, we use uh, Photoshop for the designs. I mean, um, uh, in terms of uh, 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 libraries. 
Uh, for prototyping, it's uh, paper, pen, that's it. Yeah, most of the times. And sometimes we use balsamic. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.